Most of us spend our whole lives trying to avoid negative experiences. Listen to why Dan never protects his team from the full benefit of learning from what didn't work. Hi, Shannon Waller here, and welcome to this episode of Inside Strategic Coach with Dan Sullivan. Dan, in our last episode, which was all about granting others uniqueness and unique ability teamwork, you made mention of not wanting to interfere with the full impact of someone learning from their negative experience. Mm -hmm. You have a no rescue policy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to dive into this because this is a different philosophy that a lot of people have in terms of working with other people. Yeah, well, first of all, I like to step back a little bit and talk about how I've kind of trained myself and educated myself. I think, you know, as far as I can remember, because my mother actually gave me a a lot of encouragement just to learn from my own experience. And what I mean by that, you learn from your good experiences, but you learn from your bad experiences. Bad being that in the moment they happen, that feels bad. You know, it feels like a failure. It feels like a defeat. And you feel like you've been set back by the experience. And my feeling is the badness of that experience over the long run is the fact that it happened to you and you didn't learn anything. So there's a possibility that it could happen again because Mm. not learning from the first time it happened, you're probably setting yourself up for it to happen a second time. And I have a personal goal that I fully appreciate the learning value of mistake, but I really have a passion for not repeating the mistake. I believe that most of the learning value of a mistake should be in the first time so that it doesn't need a refresher in the second time. Okay. (laughs) It's a good way to talk about it. Yeah. So I don't worry too much about making mistakes. I don't worry about getting it right. I try to look at everything I do from the standpoint of who I'm doing it for. Mm -hmm. And if they judge that what I've done is really good, then in my mind, it's good. No matter any thoughts I may have had about how it could have been better, and I'm sort of disappointed. And I find perfectionists never look at things from other people's point of view. They only look at it from sort of some internal standard, which is absolutely meaningless in terms of anything that happens outside of them. You know, I can remember times when I was very perfectionistic when I realized, you know, this is a game I'm playing with myself. This has nothing to do with whether other people find me valuable or not. So I I have a rule that my criteria for what we create in Strategic Coach is that it's all about check writers. You know, if you want to know whether something you've created is really valuable, check it out, you know, actually go out and test it out with someone who could write you a check for it. And they'll either write you a check or they won't write you a check. And if they don't write you a check, you can really turn that negative experience into a positive experience saying, okay, so if you were to write a check for this, what would have to change about it? Is there some part of it that's valuable that I should keep and then other parts I change? And you turn the rejecting check writer into a creative partner, Mm. a creative partner. And they'll tell you, they say, well, if you change this and this and this. And the other thing is you're kind of off base here because you think that I'm looking for this and I'll tell you what I am looking for. I'm looking for this over here. But most people get rejected. They get a no and they back off and they feel rejected. They don't transform the experience inside themselves, but they never learned anything from the other party in the presentation, and I'm putting this into marketplace context because that's entrepreneurism, the reality of our entrepreneurial lives is what happens between us and check writers in the marketplace. But I always turn my check writers into creative partners, you know, and uh, I don't get emotionally connected to something new that I create until I find out that the check writer has fallen in love with it. And when the check writer falls in love with my ideas, I like my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> then you get to fall in love. I like my ideas right. and, and everything else. But I just see it as a constant process. So what I've learned is not to interrupt my own learning you know, in relationship to negative experience, but just accept it fully and just take it on and say, okay, what happened here? And walk around it, go back, 
And I have a pretty good emotional memory. I have a pretty good conversational memory. So I remember what was saying. And I said, so how did I approach that? I said, you know, that was really, really interesting. What was happening? And I'll just go back and I'll replay it. And I'll just stay with it. And I said, okay, you didn't like the experience, but here it is. You've actually learned a lot from the experience. You didn't get cash <laughs> as a reward, but you got learning as a reward. Mm -hmm. So if you accept that something is good, any experience is good, is that it either gives you cash or it gives you learning, and the best ones give you both. So that same attitude that I've applied to myself to get where I am in life, I also apply to everyone who's working with me. When they have a bad experience, you know, and it doesn't work, I'll say, okay, so why don't we identify what did work? If there were things that you did that don't need changing, what were the good things you did and you did that? Okay, it wasn't 100% setback. It wasn't 100% negative experience. It was this much. Now, what didn't work? And then they're freed up because they have some, first of all, I'm putting the ball in their court. You know, I said, you know, look, you're the one who has to do this again. You have to go into this experience again. So I'd just like to help you get the maximum learning from this so you can improve yourself. And maybe the system has to be, maybe it was partially you and maybe it was we didn't support you properly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about our system. And I invariably find if it seems like a personal mistake, it's largely a system mistake. And this is how you improve your system, by not punishing people for having negative experiences. Mm. And then I want them to show themselves how they can reward themselves for having a negative experience, that every time they make a mistake, if we handle it in such a way that they jump ahead in their understanding, they jump ahead, and then the next performance is much better than anything they've done before. And I want them to have that constant feeling, don't be afraid of making mistakes. The only loss in a mistake is where you didn't get paid or you didn't learn anything, and that's a real loser. And then the chances are you'll repeat the mistake, and that's a double loser. Mm -hmm. So that's my attitude about the whole thing. So I never rescue people because I think you do a profound disservice to the person by rescuing them because you've said there's an alternative to winning and there's an alternative to learning. There isn't an alternative to winning and there is no alternative to learning, but there may be a delay where you have to transform yourself. And I want them to be completely freed up and confident that they can use their experience and transform it into new strategy, new skill, maybe an entirely new way of approaching the situation. And I don't want in any way to interfere that they don't get the full impact of their negative experience so that it, in the future it produces a totally positive result for them and for us. They're part of our team, so we benefit from their improvement. This is such a great topic, Dan, and your way of looking at it is so opposite to parenting strategies. Well, I would say ineffective parenting strategies and people's, you know, helicopter parents, snowplow parents who clear all the obstacles out of the way. And I think some of that has carried into the workforce and as well. Just general purpose jerks. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's just general purpose jerks out there who always are hitting on people for mistakes. Right. And everything just gets paralyzed and everything stagnates because people become afraid of risking anything or doing anything new because they might get a mistake that they get punished for. I said, look, the person has already been punished by the negative experience mm -hmm. inside themselves. You don't need to do it. They would like to improve it. They would like to transform this. And if you give them you know, a proper structure and a process for doing it, an enormous amount of encouragement to actually try again and improve themselves, you really keep things very, very energetic and you keep things very, very confident and people are very, very motivated by just trying new things because mistakes are not a bad thing. Again, the impact of this to my mind is kind of stunning. A couple things. One is you really help people think about their thinking. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to just being in that emotional reactive zone that happens after you get a whack. Mm -hmm. The world did not like your approach on something. There's an opportunity to step back and that, you know, we have this awesome tool and coach called the Experience Transformer. And you've always said this, the box to describe, you know, because these are all amazing thinking tools, but the box to describe the situation is quite small. 
Mm-hmm. It's like briefly state the experience you want to transform or learn mm-hmm. from. That's the language. And then what about the situation work? So we're doing a positive focus. And you point this out a lot because this tool actually used to be called the negativity transformer. Mm-hmm. And then we realized, oh, it actually works on everything. But in any bad situation, as you said, it wasn't all bad. Mm-hmm. There's always something that worked well. And then what didn't work? And when you can look at it dispassionately, what happens is that people – take responsibility for what worked, and then they also take responsibility for what didn't mm-hmm. work. So if they missed a step or skipped something, now we have to add to the mm-hmm. system. If they weren't the right person for that particular task, it becomes so much easier at that point because you're now thinking about it, you're writing it down. Mm-hmm. They can get a lot smarter really, really fast. And then again, what would you do differently next time to have a different experience? So that learning tool is so useful, and we've done it We've done it to solve train wrecks, as we occasionally call them. We've done it when things did not go the way that we wanted. We've used it to transform experiences that went well that Mm -hmm. we wanted to replicate in the future. So there is this, when people live without being in fear of being punished, Mm -hmm. it's, as you said, creative, energetic, fun. People don't dread failing. And they enjoy risk taking because... The only consequence is they'll win or they'll learn, Mm -hmm. which is a great environment and great entrepreneurial Mm -hmm. environment to be in. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that is the people who are most risk averse because they don't want to be punished actually cause the greatest breakdowns Mm -hmm. because they're not responding to changes they should be responding to. Mm -hmm. So invariably, the greatest, most expensive mistakes in society are bureaucratic mistakes where people's status and their rewards, their greatest punishments in being in a bureaucracy is that they made a mistake, Mm -hmm. okay? And their greatest reward is that they played it safe. Right. But then the whole organization becomes risk averse and it stops responding to negative feedback. You know, it begins defending itself. And everything it happens at the government level, corporate level. And I think that one of the reasons people choose to be entrepreneurs and then create entrepreneurial companies is that they want to be free throughout their work life from bureaucracy and being in like a bureaucratic environment. But if the entrepreneur himself exhibits the same behavior as a bureaucratic boss and punishes their, then you've just created a little bureaucracy and it's worse because in a big bureaucracy, you you got enough rooms and enough floors to get away from people. But in a, a little entrepreneurial bureaucracy, you have to be with the same people every time. And it's very stifling. And uh, I said, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you really want to be freed up from kind of the cliched image of bureaucracies, then you got to approach mistakes and failure from a way that is completely different from the way that bureaucracy does this. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not about status, it's about transformation, you know, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs who they're really great and they take big risks to become an entrepreneur. And then as they become more successful, they start looking like a corporate executive and they want the corner office. And I said, gee, what a terrible waste. You had everything going for you, and then you screwed it up by trying to be a corporate bureaucrat. (laughs) It's so true. And having worked with team members who work for some of those people, it's not pretty, and they can't escape. Yeah, and I found that we're always leery of hiring people who have worked in big bureaucracies because they bring a lot of very unfortunate risk-averse tendencies because they've been punished. Yeah, they and have, they expect to be punished when they come here. And they have a lot to unlearn. Yeah. You know, if someone detested being part of a large bureaucracy, then possibly. But if they loved it, then coach is not yeah, the place yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very and, true. Uh, and you can't hide. I mean, there are places to hide in a large bureaucracy because there's meetings and meetings and just seems to be a, an overwhelming amount of meaningless communication and work, whereas in a entrepreneurial company, you're so close to the marketplace and cash flow is totally determined by you being alert and responsive to going on. Well, the place where you have to mostly practice alert and responsiveness to get ready for that front stage out in the marketplace is backstage with the way that you 
work with each other. So anybody who works with me and gets in trouble, they have to know right up front, I'm not going to rescue them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to try to shield them from failure. I'm going to give them the absolute full benefit and the full impact of their negative experiences to learn from. And they'll grow really fast if they treat it as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. I love it, Dan. You've just coached all of us on how to be more creative in terms of our responses. And there's a fun little factoid that we mentioned before, but creative and reactive have the same letters rearranged. Different context. <laughs> Very different yeah. context. Same components, different context. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The other thing I'm taking away from this conversation is that really engaging your audience, be that the marketplace or an internal mm -hmm. audience even, as your creative partner to learn from, as opposed to you know, playing it safe and not wanting to risk anything is quite a neat approach. And that's, I think a lot of people haven't really thought of it that way. And the other thing is just to really help people, coach them to learn from their experience quickly and sit down with them and just help them do it. And that way they take much greater ownership of their experience. And then you've got a growth partner, not someone who's mm -hmm. a corporate bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Love Thank this. you. Thank you.